Hi, I'm Dr. Christopher Newman. I'm Professor of Space Law and Policy at the University of Northumbria in Newcastle in the United Kingdom. I'm also International Space Law Advisor for the Cold Star Technologies. I listen to the Cold Star Project. This show is for entertainment purposes only and is not what is termed professional advice. The Cold Star Project is proudly presented by the Operational Excellence Society. Cold Star Tech is a supporter of the OPEX Society, and Jason Canigan is a member of its board of advisors. Talk with us at Cold Star Tech to find out what we can achieve together with your Lean Six Sigma or Operational Excellence programs. And check out opexsociety.org to learn more. I'm really excited to bring you my guest today, Adam Anderson, who has a background in cybersecurity, space, and venture capital. And what I love about the guy is he's, he is super friendly, <laughs> but I'll, his head screwed on straight. And this is really, really important because we've got a lot of space and defense founders out there who are in love with their technical idea and think that because they built a, an interesting mousetrap, not even a better mousetrap, an interesting mousetrap, that the world is going to beat a path to their door. That is simply not the case, and that is a recipe for failure, and Adam knows that. So what Adam has done is uh, created successful... Uh, cybersecurity businesses and he wants to bring that to space. He's a member of the Board of Advisors for Space for Humanity. We didn't even touch in on that. Um, continues to be the chairman of, uh, of his own cybersecurity firm and is the managing general partner of uh, ANSUS Capital, which is the venture capital firm by which he gets involved in uh, the startup investing. And so our conversation today is going to be all about the idea of what a founder in a space or defense company, uh, what your headspace really needs to be like, what your approach should be like, what indicators you should be looking for, what the path is going to be like, because a lot of people get in, uh, and we'll discuss that, to be sort of that fun-loving mad scientist, right? Uh, <laughs> going around creating things, doing cool stuff. And unfortunately, that often does not lead to revenue. And so, uh, I feel like I'm on a mission to kind of knock some sense into you poor guys, <laughs> I love you, uh, and so that you do get the chance to bring your wonderful creations to the world, right? Uh, and, and to do that we need uh, something, an injection of capital revenue. So let's bring Adam on, he's going to share with us some of the insights that he's had over the last bunch of years, and uh, we'll all learn a lot from them, it's a great conversation. Adam, welcome. All right, Adam, rapid fire question. See, folks, it says super nice guy there. So, you know, mm -hmm. the background can be trusted. So <laughs> tell us a little bit, Adam, about how you got involved in space investing. You've been on a journey. You started somewhere and you got to here. So yeah, tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Well, the, the first thing is I want to do a disclaimer. If someone has to put on their Zoom background, super nice guy, you should trust but verify right? Usually you want to question somebody who's mm. like that. So um, yeah, uh, I am in um, space investing. And what I really look at is cybersecurity companies mm. that are assisting space companies. Um, and I'm also working on a, uh, a, an alcohol company and adapted manufacturing in space. So that's where I'm at today. The way I got there was through 23 years of cybersecurity. And so I built a cybersecurity company, ran it for 10 years, fired myself, put a professional management team in place. They ran it for another three years. We eventually sold it. And I have started around 20 companies over the last 20 years. Um, and the only ones that have been successful are cybersecurity companies. So my wife lovingly said, hey, um, why don't you stick to things you're good at? <laughs> so... So I'm, I'm currently chairman of the board for Hook Security, a company I founded, have a CEO running that, um, and I'm doing a bunch of other fun things. But um, primarily my focus, my investment engine is uh, uh, our fund called Anzus Capital, and we do cybersecurity for various industries, and a big chunk of our portfolio is going to be focused on space. And it needs it. <laughs> it's this part of the whole infrastructure thing. Yep. Security, very, very important. Okay. Talk to us a little bit about the level that you've been involved in space investing, like company size, maturity level. Where do they start? Where do you take them to? That kind of thing. So, uh, early stage is the right stage for us because unfortunately what I have found is, um, and again, this is from a particularly, I'm investing in cybersecurity companies focusing on space. As soon as they catch traction, they grow very, very, very quickly. 
Mm-hmm. And so unless you're sitting on $500 million in your fund or enough money to participate oh. inside of a series A or series B, you have a very small window of opportunity where your money is going to take you a long way inside mm-hmm. of a company. And it's usually seed or bridge rounds where the company is still proving their, um, mm-hmm. um, their stuff and because once they get past that, there's so much capital out there ready to deploy that um, when the company's demonstrated that it's no longer risky, just all kinds of whales come in to invest. So we're early stage. Okay. Now the whaling, <laughs> that's not so common we've seen in, in the space industry. Uh, we've, we've seen a lot of folks out there with technological ideas uh, mm-hmm. wanting to change the world. And then you go ask them, who's your customer? And they have no idea. They kind of give you a funny look. That's it. Yeah. That's it. You, so. you, you, I think that's the most important thing in the whole world, what you just said. Well, that was a strong statement. Uh, I mean, my kids are probably important. But anyway, <laughs> when you're in the yeah. investment world, the, the, one of the most important things is when you're looking at a company, um, space or otherwise, it's how are you generating revenue and have you proven it? Mm-hmm. Having proven that you know how to talk to another human being who's in charge of a budget inside of a company or an organization and have a fit between what they need, what you can provide at a price point you both agree on, and you can do it over and over and over again. And then my next question is, how many of those people are there on this planet? Because, <laughs> you know, ah, I sold to the one guy who will buy. Okay, great. I'm happy for you. But in those early stages, when we're thinking through due diligence, I'm not really caring about your technology. I assume you know what you're doing. Um, we'll, we'll, we will take a look at it. But at the end of the day, I'm like, I'm going to count on you getting customers as proof your technology works. Because if a customer buys your stuff, they've already done their due diligence far beyond I ever will in your tech. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, early stage companies, pre-series A that have customers. <laughs> is that a unicorn in the space industry <laughs> uh yeah and that's yeah. one of the reasons why it's sometimes more fun to play in supply chains and adjacent fields like what i'm doing so mm-hmm. i'm not investing in rocket companies but i sure will take a look at technology companies that are supporting space and might have customers in other verticals that are mm-hmm. paying the bills as they're pivoting into space okay good uh, you know, there's there's always something that will set an investor off or somebody off. Uh, for Mark Cuban, it's things like utility patents for zippers or something like that, just driving berserk. Uh, for me, it's the public's fixation on launch. They ah. always want to talk to me about launch. And I'm like, shut up. There is so much more to space than launch. Right? Right. And you're talking about adjacent fields. And so I like that. I want to hear more about that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that the, the big central chunk of this discussion that I want to have with you today is about brutal lessons <laughs> from investing in and around the space industry. You know, what's the most frustrating thing that you keep seeing? And we may have already touched on it. Let's call it out. Okay. The thing that is most frustrating to an investor, well, there's actually three things. Can I can can I yes, do that? Elaborate, elaborate. Um, the first one is uh, an entrepreneur who's completely obsessed with their technology and not on the value the technology brings. So there's a lot of really smart cats who say, "Check out my whiz bang IP," and like neat. Has anyone used it? And we talked about the traction part of it, right? And so you believe that you have this thing and if only you got funded, you could get the selling thing going. Great. Uh, That's frustrating because um, those are a lot of your opinions and you're probably right, but I need proof because I'm representing other people's money. Um, The second thing that I think that is um, a huge lesson learned is the actual um, uh, team, right? Mm -hmm. And so... At this stage, you're not going to have overwhelming proof of your traction. Otherwise, you wouldn't need money. Um, So what I need to see is team dynamics. I need to see how you interact with your team. And one of the ways I measure that is I want to see the humor in the team. Uh, My dad did psychological warfare, combat stress, and handled some death and dying work inside of the Air Force. And during Desert Storm, Desert Shield, he found that the best performing units were the ones that had the best humor and the closer you got to the front lines the better the humor got because these people mm-hmm. were taking care of each other so i want to see team dynamics right and what usually happens is i 
it's frustrating to only meet the CEO. And it's frustrating wow. to not be able to see how the team interacts with each other. So when uh, it, it's appropriate, I want to be able to see the team interact. I want to, uh, and I get a lot of that from some of the materials that they sent. Um, mm. I had a third one and it'll come to me. It was so good too. <laughs> All right. Well, we can always come back to that, but yeah. uh, let, let me interrupt that train of thought then with how the heck do you observe people in their environment? Obviously we can't have a drone or cameras following them around for a month. You just don't have the time yeah. to do that, uh, you know, at their place of business. Right. And so what, when they, when they meet you for the pitch or, you know, like you say, some of the marketing materials, this is where you get a chance to see. Some of it, and and we really believe that when uh, an entrepreneur is looking for money, it's a it's usually at this age stage we need it next week, right? Speed mm -hmm. is important, and so just like you said, you don't have the luxury of sitting around. But if I'm looking at putting 500k to a million to 4.5 million to whatever, you know, based off of the number, if it's less than 500 thousand, probably I'm not going to want to meet the whole team. Mm -hmm. If it's a million or more then I probably am going to want to jump on a conference call or fly out to visit and just take a day or two. It's, it's worth our money to mm. see how people interact. And it's also super unfair, right? How <laughs> someone could be having yeah. a bad day. Like their dog had a, a crap on the floor. They stepped on it. Now they got to stand in front of this stupid venture guy or whatever. Yeah, I get it. Right. Right. And so uh, I like personality assessments, but I want to ask anybody to do that until we've got to a point in due diligence. And I also um, take personality assessments with a grain of salt because mm -hmm. they're not de facto. Um, but what, what I'm really looking for is a blend. So if you say, here's a guy who knows how to sell and get customers, here's a guy who knows how to do the financials and run the back office. And we got, uh, and here's the, the, the girl who's able to make the whole thing come together and is the right CEO, right? I'm looking for that kind of blend of understanding roles, responsibilities, and then the very last thing we're going to do is background checks and hmm. reference checks where, you know, if I keep calling and your VP of sales, every reference is, we were so glad to see him go. He was really talented, <laughs> but he sucked in our team. So, and that, that's the idea here is we want to have a psychologically safe hmm. relationship with our portfolio companies. And that means everyone has to know, like, and trust each other. And if you're sitting on the best deal in the world and you're really great and, but we're picking up something that just doesn't jive with our culture and how we want to do business. The safest thing for all of us to do is back off and say, no. Okay. So folks, listen, listen to what Adam is saying. He is not interested so much in your technology. This is not the Borg. Right? <laughs> he is more interested in assimilating your culture, <laughs> the culture fit, right? Yeah. And, and checking it out. Um, and that sounds like it's even more important than message to market fit initially. All right. Yeah. Uh, we could technically figure that out later with a little more runway, but should I trust you to give you the money to have that runway? Yeah. So, hmm. Are you, are you coachable? And by the way, when yeah. I say, are you coachable? It isn't, I have all the answers and you should do what I say. Hmm. Coachable means, are you willing to see the world as a classroom? And as you get more information, you're brave enough to make decisions based off of the stuff in front of you. Mm -hmm. and, and being a coachable also means that you involve the entire team with it, where you're not looking at the board as something you have to, that's a, I'm going to hold you accountable to the things you say. Mm -hmm. When you build it, when you build a board for a startup, especially in the seed range, I mean, it's not a matter of, of holding accountable. It's about these mm. people helping you achieve goals, getting customers, getting funding, all these things. That's what that board's supposed to do. Not like, well, you said you were going to hit those targets and where's the revenue? And yeah, they will say those hard things, but the CEOs in their complete right to say, yeah, it would be a lot easier if you would actually help me find those customers as we're building our selling system, de-risk the early stage. I, I think that's mm -hmm. another challenge that I find with early stage companies is that they don't understand what the purpose of their board is. And so they'll just put people on it who are, are nice or can give them optics. Right. I, don't, I don't care about optics. I care about customers and I care about you winning in the marketplace and no one burning out while they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Adam is not interested in a bunch of class A hired guns banding together to do a job. This isn't the magnificent seven <laughs> <laughs> where they're just there. They got to get along too. And, uh, and not hate each other and be have learning. You, have you seen the NASA research on teams? Because they're trying, yeah. you know, we're going to be shoving people into capsules and sending them all over the place. Hmm. 
and I'm going to mess up some of the data. So I'm not going to quote that stuff, but I, there was a, a thing that I loved, which was we have found a team of S experts does not necessarily make an expert team. Yeah. Hmm. And so the, I think it's the uh, H E R a project. Uh, uh, I, I don't know what it is. I'll, I'll dig it up and send it your way, but they're studying psychological security and how to build the best kind of teams. And so that's exactly what I am looking for. I'm looking for a founding team that can be stuck in a capsule for six months together, doing something yep. incredibly difficult and nurture and be kind to each other and have grace for themselves and each other as they are wrong about 50% of what they think they know mm -hmm. and, and they don't know which 50%. So it's like, you right. gotta go, you gotta go, right? right? Learn fast, take care of each other. Yeah. Uh, just thinking back, you know, that psychological teamwork in space, uh, that was being talked about in the sixties and stranger in a strange land, right? He, mm -hmm. was, he was talking about that, um, our favorite bald headed writer, but you know, being wrong 50% <laughs> of the time I'm reaching over. I got two books on my, uh, my desk right now. One from, uh, our last discussion that you recommended. Oh, there it is. <laughs> million there dollars. Is. But, uh, but this one, which I will, whoop, there we oh, are. Oh, there Business it is. model generation, right? Get out and find out what's really going on in the world. I'll ask Steve Blank, right? And, uh -huh. and test those theories. So, and uh, I will continue to recommend those books, especially the, the, the business model generation one. Um, I've got the new one too in hardcover out there. Um, about mm -hmm. uh, startup businesses by the same authors. So let's talk about pitching for a second then, because you see a lot of pitches. What is the one thing that, that you just keep banging your head against the wall every time you see a picture like, oh my gosh, I can't believe once again, you guys have not included this that you would like to see. Um, the business opportunity is proportional to the problem you're solving it mm -hmm. and the scalability of your solution. So when you come to me and you assume I understand how big the problem is and why it's a problem, <laughs> and then you just gloss over it. Like um, I was looking at an executive summary and I love a one pager that's got like seven things on it. Problem, solution, you know, problem, current solution. What's wrong with it? Da, da, da. I love all that. Right. Give me a one pager, not a pitch deck. I don't <laughs> want that yet. <laughs> and that problem is um, space is unexplored. Okay, cool. <laughs> Neat problem. How about giving me the results that we are experiencing because the problem exists? When I don't see that tied to the mission or what you're trying to do, then like the wind gets taken out of my sails because now I can no longer imagine a future where that problem is fixed. So people go, here's the problem, here's the solution. But you haven't gotten me bought into the fact that the problem actually has some kind of result that I care about. And by me understanding the results or the, uh, or the impact of that problem on the world, I will then be able to understand the potential size of your deal and how big your company can go. Because your company cannot get bigger than the problem that you are solving. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> so to me, that's the number one thing is that right out of the gate, I will become completely disinterested and I won't even finish the one pager because I'm like, ah, I don't get the point because I don't see the problem in a way that I understand. Right. Um, yeah. Super important. I, I have written about that idea of your business can only grow as big as the way you're thinking about it. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and, and that size of the problem that you're solving on my blog, my sales and marketing blog at salestactics.org. Um, that blog has been around seven or eight years now. It's been a while. It's not just something that <laughs> I tried, you know what uh, I mean? A lot of people yeah. just come and go. I bet you could just repost your articles over and over yeah. again because sales... Yeah doesn't change. Doesn't, no, it, it's all the same thing. And you yeah. just need to grind through it over and over again. That's what I've been doing is pulling some of the older articles and adding on a paragraph about what's new for 2022 <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I've written once nothing. Yeah, <laughs> The it's concept like, is the same. No, you guys still need to hear this. So here it is. Yeah. yeah. I changed yeah. the fonts in my post and that way it's a little different. <laughs> So another thing, though, that you said that I want people to pick up on is, uh, and this goes back to investors are not interested in the technological brilliance of your solution yet, right? Correct. Give, give Adam, give the venture capitalist the information in bite-sized chunks 
so that he can assess quickly, is this something interesting to me? Do I want to find out more about it? Rather mm-hmm. than going thump, look at this thud factor. You well, know? <laughs> like and there, there's, there's, media. There, yeah, <laughs> there, there's just like gates you have to cross yeah. before I want to get into your, your like. So the very first mm-hmm. gate is, is the problem you're solving inside of my investment thesis? Mm. Right. And I've, and I've written it up. It's on my website. I tell you exactly what I'm investing in, the problems I'm trying to solve, and what my limited partners are expecting. Mm-hmm. So the, if you come to me and you say, I got this great idea, and it doesn't fit into the things that are on the website, right. you're dead to me. I'm not even going to go through it. And you're probably brilliant, and I'm going to regret not investing. But my job as a venture fund is to, or a private equity fund, or any kind of fund you want to call yourself, we have limited partners who invested in our, com- our, our funds. They gave us money. And on their behalf, we are going to invest that money. And the reason they gave us that money is because they believed in our investment thesis. So I have a fiduciary responsibility. Maybe that's too strong. I have a responsibility back to my limited partners to do the thing I promised them I was going to do. And I always give myself 20% wiggle room to say, well, that's a great opportunity. I'm going to go ahead and do that. But 80% of the money that we raise is going to be deployed inside of this thesis. So if your problem and solution do not match with my thesis, diving into your technology, and then I have to pull that information out of you Mm. in order to figure out we should even be talking. And I have to sit through your pitch on. So the way that the servers are configured, we're going to go serverless with blockchain and a DeFi. And I'm like, oh, God, you said all of the buzzwords. (laughs) Thank you very much. But what problem, what industry, why are they buying? You know, those are the the things is Mm. that companies don't work without revenue and people don't spend money if you're not fixing a problem that they care about solving. Right. And unfortunately, what you said, people will be nodding at, you know, companies don't work without revenue. Uh, I talk to founders every week in space and defense who don't know that. And I tell mm-hmm. it to them and they're like, yeah, that's nice, Jason, but I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing and inventing stuff. And I, well, I go, well, you're a nice guy and you're a smart guy, but eh, okay. But I that's great. You're going to have to fall on your face and run out of runway and learn the hard way. And that's unfortunate. I met a guy at a tech transfer event mm-hmm. and he was a really, he, he looked like a tall, skinny hippie. He was fantastic. He was just like everything I wanted to, to uh, like, like, yes, this guy, he looks like he thinks differently. He might even have questionable body order, but you know, we're going to get by all of it. <laughs> and he began talking about his technology and the big thing. And I had a couple other experienced entrepreneurs with me. And I was like, cool. Well, how are you going to monetize all that? Hmm. He's like, monetize all that. I'm saving the world. I'm like, oh, you're an inventor. You're not an entrepreneur. Right. Know thyself. Go be the best inventor in the world and work Mm -hmm. for somebody else inside of their dream and give them the energy they need to make that dream come true and stay being that inventor. Mm -hmm. It's so depressing when you have inventors try to live outside of their wheelhouse Mm -hmm. and they distract themselves because you know what we need inventors to do. We need them to invent. We don't need them to be worrying about HR issues or fundraising or how should I, how should I configure my books that's exactly what I want a high-end scientist inventor doing is worrying about his chart of accounts and QuickBooks. Mm-hmm. So if you're an inventor and you know that you are not wanting to do all that work, set aside 10% of your company, 5%, I don't know what the right number is. Go get a professional CEO, take the role of CTO and let this person do the work that you know you don't want to do and keep going. There's a difference between being a founder and being the CEO, the CEO is a job. Yeah. Founder is a position inside of the ecosystem of how a company gets started. And I get out of CEO as fast as I can. Mm-hmm. Chair of the board, so much better. So usually I am chair of the board and chief strategy officer. And I put a CEO in mm-hmm. so I can elaborate on strategy. And then I tell my boss, the CEO, to go report to me in the boardroom and convince me he's doing a good job. (laughs) And they get to go implement. And they get to go implement. And you stay focused on the things that you love and you let an operator handle the other stuff. Right. Thank you, Adam, for the reminder um, that the the inventor, they don't, yeah, 
the inventor types don't have to be CEOs. I, <laughs> that may not seem like an option or have not seemed like an option because to me, I, I would just get mad at the mad scientist for trying to be a business owner. Yes. Um, so this is a great reminder for me to take a deep breath and go, oh, you should just go be a mad scientist. You should be a mad scientist. <laughs> go, so, do, go do it. You know, the, yeah. You don't the, have to. The mad scientist also has to hold the vision. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what will happen is when you hire that professional CEO to come in, often they are going to create very safe companies that work. And you have to be disruptive as your mad scientist self to say, I get it, but we're looking at going here, not a safe hill. We're building something amazing. And so as a chair of the board, you have a responsibility to help clarify and crystallize the vision of the company. So the CEO can hold that vision hmm. and move us forward. It's really, really important to remember that just because the CEO is there, that doesn't mean that the CEO is the company. Now it's hard on it because if you look at the news, we are all wowed by the tech entrepreneur who never gave up on being the CEO. I mean, I just finished an Elon Musk biography and I was like, whoo, that is not how I would do things, but you know, <laughs> and, and, and for every one of these Elon Musk stories where the tech entrepreneur was tyrannical and made the thing happen or, you know, and, and all that should be taken with a grain of salt. I haven't met the man, but in this book, that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. Steve Jobs, we got, you know, all these guys, right? Mm -hmm. The reason they made the news is because they're rare. If it's newsworthy, they talk about it. That that's, I like winning. I like winning. Right. You know, I'd like base hits that win the game. I like knowing that I'm in it for 10 years and I don't have to be flashy, flashy PR guy. My, my job is to deliver great returns from my limited partners and help support entrepreneurs make the world a better place. And the world is a better place when we work together. It's not a better place when you have to put the weight of the world on one human being's shoulder and say, build this company. That's unfair to the yeah. entrepreneur. And it, yeah, it doesn't work out that well. Shockley Labs and uh, Fairchild Semiconductor are a great example of that, right? Uh, the, mm -hmm. the one person's iron fist caused the traders eight to leave <laughs> and form their own more successful company. So That's it. we don't really want that. Okay. Adam, what have you seen consistently as a hurdle with companies and startups moving from pre-revenue to post-revenue? They're doing a zero to mm -hmm. one move here. What, what do you think constantly derails them from, uh, from getting there? And they don't really understand how sales works. Ooh. So some of the times we feel like if uh, I just hire the right salesperson, they're going to go out there and sell something. Okay. Right. And so what you do is you say you're a hundred percent commission because I have no money. Mm -hmm. Okay. You just hired a volunteer. Great. Okay. Now go out there and succeed. But there has been no, system created mm -hmm. the person doesn't know the technology or the problem or have the empathy and you're starting this thing because you have insight into a problem in an industry or technology that you are an authority on maybe you're not the best in the world but you definitely have an authority on it and no one really can replace you being curious in front of customers mm. so the one of the big things is outsourcing sales or trying to hire sales away when at early stage, it's not about selling, mm -hmm. it's about finding collaborators who also happen to be customers. Mm -hmm. Nobody can do that better than the founding team who's authentically curious mm -hmm. about matching what they're doing to early stage adopters. And so pre-revenue, <laughs> you get so obsessed by your technology. And by the way, that's completely okay. Okay, so here's what happens. Hmm. Sales and marketing hard. I don't know how to do it. I'm exhausted. You know what makes me feel good? Winning. I'm great at making my product. I'm going to go back and I'm going to work on my product and get my dopamine hit. And I'm going to do that over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get more and more sad when I can't figure out sales and marketing. And I'm just going to keep on going back and working on my product. And I'm going to feel good about myself because the product is getting better. And eventually I will create an amazing thing that no one will ever use or see. And so that's the big trap is understanding the psychological trauma that you are in the middle of. And you have to do the uncomfortable thing. 
and I'm very generalizing here, this isn't true for everyone, but most tech founders, most engineering nerd guys are very much programmed this way. You still have to do the uncomfortable thing of going out there and talking to people mm -hmm. about what you do and getting depressed because you don't have the connections or knowing how to get to the people who are customers and saying, I don't know how to solve that problem. So I'm going to go work on the problems I do know how to solve is the kiss of death to a business. Mm -hmm. Inward focusing, navel mm -hmm. gazing, basically. But what you just said was very insightful uh, to me personally, because I have the opposite problem. I am not uh, product focused. Uh, we're a systems and process company who would be called upon to develop and implement a business development, sales and marketing program, like we just discussed, right? To give yeah. you that structure. Yeah. And, uh, and so in a sense, I don't care what the product is, Correct. right? I have to believe in it and you're not Nazifying the world with it or something like that. Right. But uh, <laughs> other than that, first checkbox, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, but other than that, you know, it, it, I care more about playing the game in the arena, right. In, yes. in being involved in this world, uh, as opposed to I'm going to change the world with my super duper space napkin or something like that. Right? Oh, yeah. By um, the way, the, so, so that my, was insightful to me to hear your, your um, run through of what the headspace of that inventor is like. Yeah, the, the inventor. Uh, and, and that's not always the case. Again, we yeah. can overly generalize, but the vast majority of tech founders are really, really good at tech. And even if they're good at emotional intelligence and have the other thing sales is a skill engineering is a skill these are things that you have to learn practice and get good at a natural salesperson is not is a myth right. some people are conditioned to be extroverts and we confuse extrovert behavior at sa as sales hmm. do you know what i love i love an introverted networker because they're there to get the job done make the connections and get out as fast as they can <laughs> When I'm there and I'm networking, I'm an extreme extrovert and I never ask for money because mm. I am just like, oh, I'm enjoying this so much. I don't right. never want this thing. Where's the after party? Let's go. Right. It's, it's, uh, so everything. <laughs> I will ask for the money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So what you have to do is know thyself, find out who you are. And then, and this is, goes back to the team building. This is getting on the, 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 uh, the capsule going to Mars, right? right? You got to make sure whoever's in that sales chair knows how to run their station and do the work that is required to make sure that the, the capsule has fuel, right? Because mm -hmm. without cash and income, the, the thing doesn't move. Right. So I, I'm all about um, fractional VPs mm -hmm. of sales mm -hmm. for startups who help them build the system mm -hmm. and then help them staff the system with people who know how to run the system. And if you don't do that, it's the same thing as saying, I don't need a backend coder or I don't need anybody who's good at, um, uh, at propulsion. Or we, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It's an actual skill set that you have to go work out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... If I were going back to this example of, uh, of the introvert uh, mad scientist who hires a hired gun salesperson, I would be very cognizant that they're on a very short runway. They yes. have to earn money. If they're on a, on a volunteer basis with you, commission only, they have to have a path to sales mm -hmm. quite quickly uh, or else three months from now, they're going to be out looking for another job, um, mm -hmm. number one. So number two. Uh, I have to go, I would have to go to you, the founder, and extract some sort of body of knowledge to create uh, some sort of inbound um, education program or something like that, right, to warm up people, to get them to self-identify, hey, I've got that problem. And so, so there would be some tough questions, like, what is the problem <laughs> that you're solving, you know, and then, and then get that in front of that salesperson so that leads can start to come in and filter mm -hmm. a little bit before they get to that poor salesperson so that they don't have to do 100% of the outreach and the qualification and the conversion, right? Uh-huh. So, there's, I just wanted to give that as, as an example to the listeners, because to me and you, that's obvious, right? But for the people that I've been talking to in the space and defense industries for the last three years, it is not. <laughs> no, and, and, and you, have to be, you have to know how your market works. So mm -hmm. for example, um, I am a bench, so I'll, I'll, one of the projects I'm working on is we're creating a, a distillery on, mm -hmm. the, on the moon. 
right? And the first step is not to go to the moon. The first step is to do something in low Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. Da 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 da. And this is something I can pre-sell before I have the technology built. And so one of the things that we fall into the trap is that we believe you have to sell a thing that exists. Wow. And what you do is you sell the thing that, that you sell the dream. It's often easier for mm -hmm. a salesperson to sell vaporware mm -hmm. and the dream of the thing that you're going to do versus, oh, here it is. Go play with it. Right. And so um, that's not always the case. If you're doing a compliance play or you're, mm -hmm. you're in a supply chain, you absolutely have to um, be careful with that. But depending on what you're trying to do, an excellent way of getting traction is to demonstrate that before the technology even exists, the customer base is so excited that they're pre-ordering. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and they could even partner up with you on vaporware. Like you, you could say, look, you'll have a hand in uh, talking about features or, mm -hmm. you know, to how, how, what direction we're going to develop yeah. this in. So, yeah, but, and, and, and that happens. I'm in a second, uh, Adam on that, everybody. Um, I run into that again, about once every week or two in conversations where I'll talk to a founder and they're very nervous about not having the thing in physical reality yet. And I tell them people sell vaporware all the time. I'm very familiar with the software as a service field and that's done yeah. all the time there. Here's what I'm intending. Yeah. Pre-order. Yeah. Do you want this problem solved? Would you like me to customize it a little bit for your uses, which is actually really good feedback for me, the creator. Oh, you'll use it if I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, <laughs> what's the use case? Way, right? you, oh, okay. You're you know, telling yeah. me why you want to buy it? Yeah. Okay. Well, oh, guess whose website marketing is getting rewritten tomorrow? Exactly. <laughs> it. That, right? so, Adam, uh, is there anything that you have noticed over time that indicates to you whether a startup team will be successful or a failure? Is there something present or missing? Um, we've talked about the humor a bit of it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a little bit of emotional intelligence. I, I'm curious also what kind of the behavioral profiles um, you like. Uh, well, I'll start with the, that question first. I love mm -hmm. Strength Finders. I love Myers Briggs. I love Enneagram. I love all of them because all of them give you some kind of window. Mm -hmm. But Strength Finders is my go-to. If I have to pick one, I do Strength Finders, um, and then I make sure that um, the, the the profiles of the Strength Finders are different. So if every single one of the entrepreneurs in the founding team rank high in ideation, meaning they're really good at thinking new ideas and they get very excited about new ideas. If hundred percent of them are like that, they will never get anything done mm -hmm. because they will all get super excited by changing the thing. So uh, I think ideation is number six for me mm -hmm. and discipline is, the, is my, um, my weakest strength. It is my, uh, I think 37. So I have horrible discipline. And so if I surround myself with people who are just like me, we will not get anything done and we'll have a great deal of fun while we do right. it. <laughs> and so I want to make sure that the people who I work with, if I was building a founding team, I would start by self-assessment. I look at my strengths. I look at my weaknesses and I make sure the next person on the team will have my weaknesses as some of their primary strengths. And then we delta and we add the next founder and we delta and we add the next founder. And so when I'm looking at these things, I'm looking for a well-balanced team of people who are motivated and behave in different ways. Mm -hmm. And these are imperfect tools. Um, mm -hmm. They are not permission. I do not have permission to not be disciplined. If I want to not have a heart attack, I still have to be disciplined about right. what I eat. So I have to go to the gym. I have to, this, the, the personality assessments are not permission to relax into your, you know, un, uh, subconscious behavior. I need you to show up to companies conscious and mm -hmm. do the work to interact with the team. But we are comfortable in autopilot. And when you mm -hmm. have to be off autopilot, you get exhausted. So your default way of showing up to the world should be complementary inside of the team. And then um, that sets up conflict. Because if I'm a high ideator and you're very, very disciplined mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh my gosh, if we change the product a little bit and you're like, nah, we got to deliver what's on our plate now. And you shut me down and we don't have healthy conflict resolution skills. I go to my, my side of the, the hall and I tell everyone what a jerk Steve is. And Steve goes to his side of the hall and says, Adam is just a complete asshat. You know I mean? It's just like, 
you will destroy the company if there isn't the ability to have that conversation. So I want diversify, I want to have diversity and strengths, and I want emotional intelligence measured by humor and conflict resolution skills in the founding team. Okay. Um, but, but there has to be somebody who is a huge dreamer and thinks big mm -hmm. because when you are approaching somebody for money, they <laughs> have a, re a responsibility to get large returns. Mm. Right. Uh, I, I, I used to be so frustrated when I was on the entrepreneurial side of the table and I could say, please, sir, may I have right. some money? Right. And I'm like, I only need 750 K and I can prove this concept and we're off to the races. And they're like, man. And I used to think that they were dumb. And actually what it was is that I didn't understand how fast they needed the company to grow. I mm -hmm. didn't understand how big they needed the opportunities to be. And I didn't know how to talk to them about it in such a way where I was, you know, communicating in their language mm -hmm. saying, I know you have to produce returns within yeah. X number of years. My company is a vehicle that will get you that in five. Let's rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And here's what I need. And it's a much larger number. <laughs> it's a know? much larger number. But okay. if you want to fuel that, that growth, then I need it. Yeah. 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 If you want oh, me to okay. produce those <laughs> results, then here's the amount of gas I need. Yeah. And in, uh, investors respond. Well, let me rephrase this. Um, Professional investors, qualified investors, investors who know what they're doing respond very, very well to that. Professional investors. Your um, friends, family, and fool rounds, I call it the, uh, the triple Fs, do not respond well to that. They're betting on the jockey, not the horse. They're like, Adam's a great guy. Here's 100K. The great guy, great market. Here's 100K. And you can find that. But when you're asking for multiple millions from a, a fund or a professional investor, they need to know how they're getting their money back and not because they're greedy It's because if they don't know how they're getting their money back, they can't go back to their general partners right. and say, this is how we are fitting into the thesis. Mm -hmm. Their the spreadsheets that they all create. If you can't make that spreadsheet work, it just doesn't fly. Matter of fact, be bold enough to say, Hey, why don't you send me a copy yeah. of your due diligence spreadsheet mm -hmm. and let me do the upfront work to make sure it actually fits mm -hmm. Or let's yeah. jump to the end and let's not do due diligence on any of our tech or any of that. So let's just find out whether or not the opportunity fits. Right. If you speak their language and show, you know, inside baseball, um, you'll definitely, you'll, you'll get your no faster or you'll get mm -hmm. your yes faster and right. speed is everything. Right. And we just terrified half the listening audience here. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 not, but not my technology but you want me to get to know fast yes i do oh, yeah. <laughs> i don't want you hanging around for two years as i've watched some people do dragging you know on the coattails of some potential investor oh yeah thinking maybe 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 if i just tweak it a little bit let's finish up with this adam in say the software as a service world we have billions of dollars at play, right? In, in venture capital. Um, startup capital is available in hundreds of millions of dollars, just shoveled at companies right away. In space, we do not <laughs> see that. We don't see that, right? With space startups yet. Is yes. there a light at the end of the tunnel that space industry startups could be developed and funded in that manner anytime soon? Or are we waiting another 50 years before this takes off? I don't think so. Especially if you aren't building a, a rocket launch comp company. There's so many space companies that need to be launched. Oh, I shouldn't use the word launch. Uh, I don't want to confuse my puns. Mm -hmm. There's so many companies that need to be created that have their feet in two different worlds. SaaS companies for space mm -hmm. um, is a great example. Uh, equipment companies for space where you can take the thing that you're really, really good at. And when you remind yourself, I'm not just doing a space company. Space is the industry your company operates mm -hmm. inside of. And the number of people who will write checks just because you're in space while growing is still small. But the number of companies, a number of individuals and other organizations and funds that will write checks for good, solid business models that happen to be targeting mm -hmm. the fastest growing market in the history of the world, 
I mean, I love the pitch where we may not be real good at what we do, <laughs> but the market's going so fast and there's right. nobody else right. out there right. for right. it. Right. The like, rising like, tide lifts yeah. all boats. Kind of thing. Yeah. Exactly. And that <laughs> absolutely plays all you need yeah. in the space industry is a couple of clients a good reputation and you will get a large adoption from you get large market mm. percentages get in the game go to the people who understand the technology you're building inside of the supply chain role that you're at and educate them on the beautiful thing that is this space industry and this this market that's just growing like crazy excellent well you had mentioned a website uh where you defined what you're looking for as far yes. as investing in that, let's let's end with that. Where should people go to learn more about your thesis, your investment thesis, and uh, potentially connect with you? Yeah, so it is anzuscapital.com, and anzus is spelled A-N-S-U-Z. Um, and what I have found is the SEC takes what you put on your website real seriously. <laughs> and so the right step to get access to the thesis and to some of the stuff to really do deep dives is you have to reach out because I have to make sure that I am working with qualified investors and qualified companies before we, uh, we go too far. So there is a onboarding process for more information because the law <laughs> so, <laughs> huh. Huh. Yeah. I don't want to go to jail. So we take yeah. this real serious. <laughs> Sounds awesome. Well, Adam, this has been amazing. I really uh, love hearing your your own experience and the emotion and that that you put into this. Thanks for doing this. Absolutely. It's been a joy. Thanks for joining us for today's interview with Adam Anderson. I really recommend that you check out Ansu's Capital. Uh, links it in the uh, description below. And also, he's got something called CEO2Owner.com with the number two being the thing in between CEO and owner in that URL. Uh, and I think that that would be a great uh, sort of coaching option for somebody who wants to make that transition from being in the trenches, doing stuff kind of guy to somebody who is uh, a little bit backed off from the day-to-day -day operations of their business. And as we discussed, those are two very different roles, being uh, the, the chief strategist, if you will, or the chief implementer. If you're looking for help with your systems and processes, I think you should come and talk to us at Cold Star Tech. If you're looking for help because you feel overwhelmed with a to-do task list that uh, is overflowing and uh, you're just firefighting every day, well, I'd say that's a symptom of a serious problem. Come and talk to us at coldstartech.com. Book an appointment to talk with me there. And uh, I look forward to talking to you soon.